Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Deb Troca, the Executive Director of the Indiana Cooperative Development Center. And we'd like to thank you for joining us today for the 2022 Virtual Farmers Market Forum. Um, we're excited to share this program with you and look forward to your participation today. The forum is part of a work plan for, the, for a grant that we received, the Farmers Market Promotion Grant received from the USDA Ag Marketing Services. The grant is a partnership of, of ICDC, my organization, Purdue University Extension, Indiana State Department of Health, Indiana Farm Bureau, Indiana Department of Agriculture, and Indiana Grown. And the goal of the project of the grant is to grow and strengthen farmers markets across the state of Indiana. Um, we're also excited to um, have you visit our new website, which is um, infmcp, it's a mouthful, .org. Um, and Christina will put that into the chat um, in case you didn't catch that. Um, the website's designed to be a repository of resources and information pertaining to farmers markets. Um, and without further ado, and to make sure Larry has plenty of time to get through his presentation, I'd like to introduce Christina Paroli who's the Grants Program Coordinator for this project and your host for the forum today. Thank you, Deb. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Larry Spilker. He's been the Director of Campbell Risk Management's National Farmers Market Insurance Program for the past 12 years, and is considered by many to be the nation's foremost expert on farmers markets and vendor risk management. Larry works closely with farmers market operators and conducts risk management seminars for farmers market associations from coast to coast. Um, I do, um, Larry, if you can actually um, hit slideshow and present slides, um, that will enable the recording. All right, so. At the very top, you have slideshow. Because I can't see the little icon. You... Yeah. No, that's a new slide. At the no, that's a new slide. Okay. At the very, very top. There's on the home tab. There's home, insert draw design, yeah. slideshow. Hit slideshow. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah, it's kind of blocked by my oh there it is. There it's up go. here too. I just see it. Okay. No, I don't try not now. Perfect. All right. Thank you. There you go. All right. All right. Well, hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, as I said, my name is Larry Spilker. I'm with Campbell Risk Management. Um, and uh, about 12 years ago, uh, we had uh, talks with uh, uh, Extension Office, the Department of Agriculture uh, out of um, Ohio, and they had requested that we look at implementing a program that would uh, be targeted for farmers markets and farmers market vendors um, because there wasn't a a resource out there uh, that was uh, available or cost effective uh, for markets or vendors to to acquire uh, the insurance that's needed for being out in a public environment, and uh, it was uh, it was a there was a there was a lot of effort that went into trying to develop a, a program that was specifically targeted to the farmers market space. Uh, but uh, over the years, it's 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 developed into uh, uh, a program that's been a blessing to many uh, vendors, small producers, and markets uh, now all across the all across the country. And uh, so we do this for for markets in in every state in the country, uh, and. Uh, have the backing of, of uh, uh, associations uh, from coast to coast. So uh, getting into the, the insurance itself and the, the, the risk that's out there that, that markets have, that vendors have, um, markets need to have their own insurance policy uh, to cover them for their own operational exposures. 
Uh, if you have somebody that comes to the market and slips and falls in one of the common areas of the market, doesn't have anything to do with the vendor's operation itself uh, or any of the vendors in there, or say you put out a sign that says market open today from eight till noon and it blows away and, and damages somebody's car. Uh, you have a welcome uh, uh, tent uh, or canopy and it blows away and injures somebody and damages somebody's car. Those kinds of things that are inherent to the actual market itself's operation uh, would be covered under the, the market itself's uh, insurance policy. Basically, you're transferring the risk from you to the insurance company. You pay a, a, a cost for that. And uh, with this particular program, it's, it's, it's pretty nominal. Um, uh, for, for a market to get, to get insurance for themselves. So if a market and most of the markets that we have fall into this category, um, uh, prior to the meeting, uh, I was told there were several questions about cost and that sort of thing. So, um, We'll just get that over with right at, right off the bat. So, so for a market to get their own insurance policy to be the named insured on the policy, XYZ Farmers Market, uh, uh, if your revenues that the market itself brings in uh, from stall fees and, and that sort of thing are under 50000 which is where most markets fall, uh, you can get a million dollar policy for two seventy five. dollars uh, for the year, uh, or you can get a $2 million per occurrence policy for 300 for the year. Uh, so, uh, that's that, that it, it would just knock that out right off the right, right out of the gate. If you're a large market and you're bringing in more than $50,000, uh, a million dollar policy runs 525, a $2 million policy runs 575. If you fall into that larger, larger category of a market that has, has more vendors and more exposure. So um, uh, as a market though, when you get an insurance policy for the market itself, it, uh, it covers the market for its exposures. But once you uh, uh, have a vendor come in and they pay for a booth space there and they set up the liability then transfers over to the vendor for their specific space. So uh, the market should be requiring the vendors to have insurance and list the market as an additional insured on the, their vendor policy. The, what, the reason behind that is that in our experience, 100% of the time that a vendor gets sued, uh, the market gets named in that lawsuit and uh, the attorneys will sue everybody. So if, uh, if you get uh, uh, a vendor that comes in in your vendor procedures and uh, uh, policies, uh, you should list in there that the vendor uh, should have their own insurance and is required to give the market a certificate of insurance, proving that they have that coverage in place and that certificate should list the market as an additional insured. So as a third party, if you get drug into a lawsuit because they set up their canopy and it blew away and injured somebody or somebody claimed they got sick or injured because of what they bought from that vendor um, uh, or you know, somebody trips over the vendor's tablecloth and injures themselves. And we've had all kinds of things that have, have, have occurred. Um, and every time the market is, is, is named in that lawsuit as well as the vendor. So as an additional insured, um, you're basically just covered under their policy uh, uh, for things that they, have, that, that they have done that weren't actually related to the market itself's operation. Um, so uh, the, the market's policy, like I say, it covers the market's exposures. The vendor policy covers the vendor for their exposures that they have for their space. Um, anything from slip and falls, something falling off of somebody's table and somebody slipping and falling on it, a box sticking out from underneath a vendor booth, somebody trips over that, uh, canopies blowing away and injuring people uh, or damaging somebody else's property. Um, uh, we have 
extension cords that seem to be run from one place to another uh, and uh, those those have a tendency to get tripped over um, uh, people even just stepping off of a curb an uneven surface in a parking lot uh, uh, those kinds of things that uh, that can cause somebody to to uh, uh, slip and fall or trip over something, those those kinds of things are what you're looking to 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 get covered in the event that 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 type of thing occurs. You also have uh, a product liability exposure, um, and the majority I can tell you the majority of claims that come through um, uh, ninety eight. 99% of all the claims that have come through over the last 12 years uh, are operational exposures. Canopy is blowing away, you know, tripping over something. Those kinds of things are, are, are really what your exposure is. We do get product liability claims in from time to time. It occurs, it happens, uh, where somebody claims they got sick or injured in some way because of something that, that, that somebody produced. Uh, and the policies should be in place to cover that type of thing of, as well. But whether they're selling birdhouses or they're selling, you know, uh, paintings or they're selling craft items um, or homemade pies, cookies, vegetables, whatever it is, uh, that operational exposure still exists. Uh, for them to be there. And it can happen whether it's a vendor that comes one time, uh, if they come four times a year, and it just happens to be that day where that, you know, wind blows through and picks up one of those paintings and blows it away and pokes some would-be doctor's eye out, you know, whatever the case might be, um, those operational exposures exist regardless of how small or, or large a vendor is. We've had very, very small vendors that are, are selling $500 worth of stuff that have had claims, uh, and we've had large vendors uh, uh, involved in, in claims as well. So um, uh, that, that, unfortunately, in today's uh, society and, and litigious uh, society that we live in, it's um, uh, important that for somebody to be in a public environment and public space that they have uh, some type of insurance in case that just happens to be the day when something awful happens. Um, <clears throat> A, a lot of questions have come up and, and been raised over the years also about um, hold harmless agreements. Uh, uh, well, instead of having insurance, can I just have the vendor sign a hold harmless agreement that agrees that they'll hold the market harmless um, in case they get sued? There's a lot of holes, a lot of holes in that. Um, the agreement if you have an agreement like that, which is great to have uh, in, your, in your policies and procedures, but if you have an agreement like that, the agreement is between you and the vendor. It's not between you and the injured party. Um, it's pretty, you'll be pretty hard pressed to have every patron that comes into the market sign a hold harmless agreement prior to entering the market crowds. So um, uh, the hold harmless agreement works great. Uh, for vendors to hold the market harmless if they themselves are injured while they're there vending. Uh, so if they, they agree that they're vending, they're there at their own risk, they agree to hold the market harmless, you can have them agree to reimburse the market if, uh, if you end up getting sued by somebody uh, uh, the, because of something that the market did. Uh, or something that the vendor did, but then you end up having to actually be able to collect that from the vendor. So say you have a vendor that uh, is selling $500 worth of blueberries a year and uh, their canopy blows away and seriously injures somebody uh, and there's a $150,000 uh, payout. Uh, and they have signed this agreement that says they agree to do it. Now you've got to try and chase down that vendor and sue them and try and collect $150,000 from them that, uh, that, that you had to pay because of something that they did. So um, uh, hold harmless agreements, like I say, are great. Um, I, I recommend them for uh, your policies and procedures. 
uh, but it's it's really more of a protection that's going to protect you as a market operator in the event that the that the uh, vendor themselves or the people that are working there for the vendors um, uh, are injured while they're there operating. Um, okay, so uh, uh, kind of went over slips and falls. That's you know, kind of a just uh, a nifty little picture of you know, that kind of thing. Believe me, happens. it happens all the time. Um, Certificates of, of insurance. Um, this, is, this is what a certificate of insurance looks like. Uh, it's a uniform form that is uh, used by every insurance company in the country. Uh, it's called an Accord 25. And all of the insurance companies, regardless of whether it's Farm Bureau or State Farm or Hanover or whoever it is, all use this, this same form, which is nice because you can look at, at a form like this that a vendor gives you and uh, it's going to be the same regardless of, of, of what insurance company issues it. But uh, so when you require uh, a vendor to have insurance and list the market as an additional insured, uh, the things to look for on the insurance certificate um, are going to be uh, that the person or entity that is coming to the market is listed here as the named insured. This is the person that actually owns the insurance policy. Um, if uh, 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 Honeybee Creations uh, is who is leasing the space, and uh, you have a different entity actually in there operating, um, that's, that, 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 that's not working. So you just wanna make sure that whoever is, is, is taking that space is, is named as the named insured on the insurance certificate that you're getting from them. Um, it's a commercial general liability policy. 99.9% uh, .9 of all commercial general liability policies um, are going to uh, be effective for a year. Uh, so you'll look for the fact that uh, they have a policy number and then here's where you'll find the uh, expiration dates, effective and expiration dates. You just wanna make sure that you're not getting a certificate of insurance from somebody that expired two years ago or uh, expires you know, the, the day after, after the, 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 they're gonna start vending at the farmer's market. You just wanna make sure that this is, this is valid. Um, one of the challenges in effective and expiration dates when you're looking at that is um, uh, they don't go on a calendar year. They go based off of whatever the vendor chooses their original effective date to be. So in this particular case, this vendor bought a policy that was effective October 21st of 2019, and it ran out October 21st of 2020. So you may end up in a situation to where you have a vendor that has a policy that uh, uh, starts, say, July 1st of 2021 and ends July 1st of 2022. Um, but your market might extend through October. Um, so if they give you that certificate, they're good up until July 1st of this year, but you want to make sure that you put a note or a reminder to yourself to remind the vendor that they need to give you that updated certificate uh, 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 prior to the expiration of the old one if it happens to expire in the middle of your, of your market. Uh, a lot of insurance companies won't offer, even offer a renewal on the insurance policy until 30 to 45 days prior to the expiration. So it's kind of challenging sometimes if, you're, if you've got a policy that expires July 1st and you have a market season from May to October um, to ask the vendor in February or March to give you a renewed insurance certificate, you know, for the middle of the season, they haven't even been offered the renewal yet. So um, it's possible they can do that. Our program allows them to renew, you know, whenever they want, but some uh, insurance companies 
just don't offer the ability to renew a policy until, you know, like I said, 30 to 45 days before. So just just be aware of that, that some policies may expire uh, mid-season and just watch for that when you're looking at your uh, effective and expiration dates. Over to the right-hand side, this shows what their limits of insurance are. Um, the per occurrence limit that you see on a general liability policy is going to uh, be the most that the insurance company will pay for any one specific claim. Uh, so in this particular case, the uh, vendor bought a $2 million per occurrence policy with a $4 million aggregate limit. The difference between the per occurrence limit and the aggregate limit is that the most that'll pay for any one claim is 2 million. The most that'll pay for any one policy year is 4 million. So you could actually have four separate $2 million claims pay out before the policy limit was exhausted for the year. So just if they had a really bad claim, uh, that doesn't mean that their insurance is over uh, for the year. It, that, that relates to the aggregate limit. Once, one, you could even have, you know, say four or $500,000 claims pay out. As long as it's not over the per occurrence limit and the, the aggregate limit has not been breached yet, they still have insurance up until the point where that $4 million is, is hit. Um, for uh, uh, markets and for uh, vendors, this insurance or this insurance certificate looks exactly the same. Um, instead of for a, a market buying a policy, uh, the market is going to have their name uh, here as the named insured. You'll have your per occurrence and uh, aggregate limits here for the market policy itself. Um, Damage to premises rented to you on an insurance certificate, that's the second limit that's shown. Um, uh, that, it relates to any one fire. Uh, so if it's, if it's property damage to a premises that's not related to a fire, uh, the per occurrence limit is what the limit is on, on, on those types of property damages. Uh, if it is if it is related to a fire, uh, then hundred thousand dollars in damages is the maximum that the insurance company will pay out. But uh, not a whole lot of fire damage issues. I don't think we've ever in twelve years had a fire claim from a farmer's market that caused uh, damage. Um, medical expenses. It says, I get a question about this all the time. This $5,000 med, med expense or med pay is not the limit that it'll pay out for medical expenses. The whole limit uh, per occurrence limit is what it would pay if somebody had, you know, had to have surgery and, and had all kinds of ongoing issues because they were hit by somebody's canopy and they had $150,000 worth of medical expenses that would pay out through the, the per occurrence limit. That med pay is just a, uh, a quick uh, underwriting limit. So basically, if somebody had a had a, a minor injury and they had to go to the med check and they cut themselves and they had to uh, get a, a couple of stitches and uh, and some antibiotics and so forth, and the total medical expenses is all that that person was seeking reimbursement for, um, the insurance company is is quick to pay out up to five thousand dollars. Once it goes over five thousand dollars. It's still covered. It just goes through a different process of uh, getting assigned over to an adjuster and they do more investigations on it and so forth. Um, if somebody just pre pre presents a receipt for $1,200 worth of medical expenses and say, hey, I just want you to reimburse for that, um, it just goes under this med pay uh, and pays out under that. Personal and advertising injury is related to more somebody's uh, feelings getting hurt um, uh, than, than uh, property damage. Um, the uh, down here at the bottom, the very bottom limit uh, is it, it says products slash comp op ag. Uh, so that's what shows that somebody has product liability uh, insurance uh, in the event that somebody 
you know, does bring out a, a suit claiming they got sick or injured in some way because of what somebody uh, produced or what they made, um, be it say, I don't know, a candle. Uh, yeah, the candle was faulty. It burnt out. Uh, it burnt out the side of the candle. It caught my house on fire and burned my house to the ground. Um, so they want to sue because the vendor sold them uh, or made a candle that 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 caused that kind of property damage, or a foodborne illness, or you know uh, uh, anything really. We had somebody that had a uh, uh, was selling pressurized. Uh, uh, pop in cans and they popped the lid and supposedly in this particular claim the uh the the it was so pressurized that the noise that it made was so loud that it damaged the person's hearing you know and they brought a lawsuit a product liability lawsuit uh up against up against something like that um 99.9 percent .9 of uh, of all uh, commercial general liability policies that insurance companies offer automatically just include products uh, and completed operations in it. There's no extra cost for it. It's just it's just part of the insurance. Um, where you'll see sometimes um, uh, it, instead of it having a limit there, you'll see uh, a statement that is actually says the word excluded. Um, uh, and that means that the, or, or it'll just be blank there. And that means that the underwriter for the insurance company that, that underwrote this particular policy, uh, specifically excluded or deleted product liability that automatically comes with the commercial general liability. That's normally a red flag. There's something there that, uh, the insurance company is concerned about that that person is offering. Uh, they may have had some bad claims experience in the past with it. Um, underwriters at insurance companies are, 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 can be really fickle. Um, we've had over the years underwriting changes with, with uh, the insurance companies where an underwriter uh, th that is underwriting uh, a particular type of insurance changes and they bring in a new underwriter. So uh, for example, we had some an underwriter that 100% that was against lip balm. They thought lip balm was the devil incarnate and that uh, there, was, there was no way that the insurance company was gonna sell insurance or offer insurance to anybody that was producing uh, uh, any kind of lip balm. Well, that underwriter left and a new underwriter took over for this same exact insurance company. And this underwriter thought lip balm was the bomb. Uh, they, they liked it and they didn't have any problem, uh, any problem writing the coverage. So um, uh, anyhow, the, as far as the product liability goes, that's where you're going to find that limit. And uh, it's there just in the unlikely event that somebody claims they got sick or injured. I think yesterday, uh, for those of you that attended the um, uh, the food safety deals. I always love to follow the food safety guys because they scare the bejeebus out of you. And then I get to come in and tell you, okay, <laughs> you know, it's not that bad for, for a nominal amount of money. You can, you can have that type of thing covered. Now, the market's policy, when a market buys an insurance policy, their products and completed operations limit does not extend to what the vendors are selling. It's just for the market itself. So if you're uh, handing out donuts or, or, or selling, you know, t-shirts with the market's name on it, you know, that sort of thing. That's for products. The market policy covers the products that the market itself is, is offering uh, uh, by the market itself. Um, the vendor policy covers the products that the vendor themselves are producing. So, all right. Uh, uh, enough on limits. Now, um, when you uh, most, oh, just real quick, um, the national uh, uh, kind of average or the, the the national accepted minimum limit that most markets um, offer or require are one million per occurrence with a two million dollar aggregate limit. Uh, 
some require higher limits uh, of, of 2 million per occurrence with a $4 million aggregate, but you'll, you'll be hard pressed to find any that, that are uh, requiring less than that per occurrence limit to be a million and the aggregate limit to be 2 million. Um, okay. The other thing that pops up on these certificates often is the how am I listed as an additional insured um, on that certificate? What am I looking for to make sure that in the event that I get drug into a lawsuit that the market itself is, is covered as a third party being drug into a lawsuit because of something that a vendor did or something that a vendor sold? Uh, one common misconception to that is just to have uh, the market's name and mailing address listed in the certificate holder box. Um, just because you see your name and, and address listed in that certificate holder box in the bottom left hand corner, that does not automatically make you an additional insured. That makes you a certificate holder. Uh, the certificate holder um, is is nice to have because the insurance company will um, uh, attempt to contact you in the event that there's been a change to the insurance policy or a cancellation of that insurance policy. So if you get a certificate from uh, uh, Bob's Potatoes and um, it expires uh, on October 1st, and they give it to you on May 1st and cancel their policy on May 2nd. Um, uh, and actually then at that point don't have any insurance co uh, coverage, uh, the certificate holder gets notified that Bob's Potatoes is no longer in effect, effective May the 2nd. Uh, so you're aware that you're holding a certificate of insurance that you think is valid, but now no longer is. Uh, so that's the advantage of, of having your name and address in that certificate holder box. Um, the description box uh, up above is is really this box here uh, is really what you want to look at uh, when it comes to making sure that you are an additional insured. So there's a few ways of of, of doing that. It can state um, in that description box that the certificate holder is an additional insured. Well, in that case, you're listed as a certificate holder um, and it states that the certificate holder is an additional insured. So that, that satisfies that requirement. That means that you're listed as an additional insured uh, when it comes to that particular insurance policy that you're seeing there. If it doesn't say anything in the description box up above, again, and you're just a certificate holder, that's, that's not going to protect you if you get drug into a lawsuit. Uh, the other thing that you can see in that description box is it specifically state, states, uh, Fisher's Farmer's Market is hereby an additional insured. Um, uh, and uh, so that takes care of it. Um, there's there's policies out there. The program that we offer includes a blanket or automatic additional insured endorsement. Um, and uh, our policies are not cancelable. They're not refundable. Uh, so they can't cancel their policy or modify their policy midterm. Uh, so that you'll never get notification from us if they get a policy through here that their policy was was canceled in the middle and they no longer have coverage. Um, an automatic additional or blanket additional insured endorsement on a policy, if you see that in the description box, um, that kicks in uh, automatically and makes you an additional insured where it has been required by written agreement. Um, with the vendor. So that's why it's important for your policies and procedures that the vendors sign off on and agree to that they've read and, and so forth, um, uh, state that they're required to have insurance and provide a certificate of insurance listing the market as an additional insured. Once you have that uh, written agreement with them uh, and they you know, initial offer sign off on it, that blanket automatically kicks in and makes you an additional insured. Um, so you can see that kind of verbiage there 
Uh, and as long as you have that in your vendor agreements, you're, 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 you're ironclad as, as an additional insured. So uh, the biggest thing to look for is just to make sure that you're not just looking at the certificate holder box, that you're also uh, looking at that description up above uh, that states that either the certificate holder is an additional insured um, or that it states that it has a blanket additional insured endorsement and you have that uh, written agreement with the vendors um, or uh, that it specifically states your name saying that you're an additional insured. Okay, um, so that is pretty much what you need to look for. Uh, we provide a service here for markets uh, regardless of whether the vendor provides you a certificate from State Farm or from Farm Bureau or from us uh, or from any other program out there. Uh, uh, we have the ability for you to either email us the insurance certificates. You can upload them through your online account as a market. If you purchase your policy through here, you can upload certificates and provide them to us. Uh, we do this as a service because we're pretty quick at being able to look at a certificate, make sure that the effective dates are valid, that the, that the verbiage at the bottom is correct and so forth. And we can very quickly uh, uh, respond back to you and say, hey, we got your certificate for uh, uh, Bob's Birdhouses and uh, it expired last year. Or we got the certificate that you provided to us and it's not showing that you're an additional insured. You want to get with him and make sure that you get a certificate backlisting uh, yourselves as an additional insured. We can, we can take a quick look at those. You won't hear from us if everything's good on it. Uh, you'll only hear from us if we find an issue uh, and we provide that service to you. We can take a look at those certificates for you and just make sure that they're, they're valid and correct. Okay. Um, uh, a, a lot of these terms, go ahead. Oh, keep going. Okay. Um, uh, common terms that are brought up. I think we, we've gone over some of these. Um, uh, one question that comes up is uh, on liability insurance, um, is there a deductible? Uh, and uh, the answer to that is no. Um, the insurance policy for commercial general liability will cover you from dollar one. There's no out of pocket expense uh, for that. And it, it covers your cost of defense whether you're found to be ultimately at fault or not. Uh, so uh, if you get drug into a lawsuit and uh, there's defense costs, then it's dismissed. Uh, ultimately, we've had that happen many times where uh, lawsuits have been brought. They've, uh, they've generated $5,000 worth of legal fees uh, that the insurance company has incurred, uh, but they pay those legal fees to get that case dismissed regardless of whether the outcome ultimately shows that you have a judgment against you for a monetary amount or it gets dismissed out of court that you just, you're not going to have any out-of-pocket expense with, with liability. Where you find deductibles is when there's property insurance involved. I mean, so if you're insuring autos, uh, you're going to have a, a deductible. If there's physical damage to your auto, you'll pay the first, like you do with your um, uh, homeowner's policies uh, for property damage or your car. If you get into an accident, you'll pay the first uh, amount and then the insurance company kicks in uh, over and above that. But as far as commercial general liability goes, uh, there's no deductible involved. Um, uh, the claimant is going to be the person that brings a lawsuit uh, against you uh, who's suing for uh, uh, food poisoning or product liability or general liability issues, those kinds of things. Um, additional insureds, we went over that. Um, uh, there's there's um, a possibility that some uh, uh, vendors 
that have a farm can get a rider on their farm policy that will extend commercial general liability to them for operating at a farmer's market uh, uh, so they can get that. But they all, but if they have insurance, if they modify their, their farm policy and they get this rider on there, they just getting a copy of the rider isn't isn't what you want. You want to have always have that Accord 25 insurance certificate uh, because that's where it's going to state that you're an additional insured. So uh, we've had uh, uh, vendors that will provide the market with a copy of their homeowner's policy uh, declaration page. You know, I've got a million dollars worth of coverage. I've got an umbrella on my homeowner's policy. That is a personal lines policy. It excludes specifically commercial operations. You know, so if you email us something like that, say, this is what, this is what I got from the vendor. Is this good? You know, will this work? We'll let you know, uh, if, if you have questions about that, but, but deck pages to homeowners policies or, or, or writers that you get copies of that sort of thing, uh, is, is, is just, just ask for an Accord 25, the insurance agent that they're dealing with will know. And if they can't issue an Accord 25, they don't have the coverage that they need to be operating. Um, uh, okay. Um, uh, hold harmless uh, agreements. We talked about, uh, about that uh, being really an agreement between you and the vendor or producer that's there. It's not between you and and generally the actual injured party that's there. So um, uh, it's like I said, it's a good idea to have those kinds of agreements in there that protect you in the event that the, the vendor themselves is, is injured while they're, while they're at the market. Um, all right. Uh, Questions. Interesting. That, so, oh, um, yeah, go ahead. Or do you have more slides? Uh, you know, I thought there was another one in the back, but apparently not. So go ahead. So um, let's let's focus in on the vendor um, policies. There was a question that asked, um, "What do vendors' policies typically cost?" Because you shared oh. what the market, what that you would pay for a market. Sure, absolutely. So uh, the um, vendors uh, are similar. We. We got this program uh, admitted and approved by every insurance company in the state, uh, in every state in the country. Um, but they they threw a, a minimum uh, policy amount to us, uh, uh, cost amount. So the minimum that we're allowed to issue a policy for uh, in the state of Indiana is 275. Uh, and so regardless of, uh, and that, so we, how that breaks down is by the amount of gross revenue that a vendor is producing uh, over a year. And that's through their whole operation. Okay. It could be their gross sales to a local grocery store, to a restaurant at farmer's markets, what they sell online, what they sell through a CSA, what's their total annual gross revenue. Um, many, many of the vendors that we deal with fall between the category of zero and 25,000. <laughs> so a million dollar policy, if they're, if they're gross revenues are under $25,000, a million dollar policy, uh, it would run 275. A $2 million policy, if they choose to have a higher limit, uh, would be 300. Okay. If they're selling, say, between 25,000 and 100,000, uh, the cost goes to 325 for a million and 350 for a $2 million policy. So there's more, the larger they are, the more exposure the insurance company feels that they have. So they charge a little upcharge if you're, if you're a larger producer. Um, if you're between 100 and 100 or 100,000 and $250,000 in gross revenues, uh, it goes to 525 for a million and 575 for 2 million. Uh, if you're over two hundred fifty thousand dollars, we're we're going to have to customize the policy for you. Um, uh, but 
in most vendors fall into that range. We've got some larger producers that are, you know, selling eight, nine hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff uh, uh, through several different um, venues or or uh, outlets or mediums. And uh, so we just write a custom policy for for those really, really large uh, producers. But most of the vendors uh, fall into that zero to twenty five. We've got some that fall in that twenty five to one hundred and 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 the 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 higher the 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 uh, gross sales amounts, it 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 wanes down to a smaller group of, of vendors uh, that you're, you'll be dealing with. The nice thing about a vendor policy, uh, we get this question quite often, um, does the vendor policy cover uh, them for selling online? Uh, it, most of the vendors we deal with in today's environment now have a website, you know, and, and they may offer products online. Some of them just promote, you know, that they're going to be, you know, this is what we're selling. This is what we're offering. And we're going to be at the Fisher's Farmer's Market on this day. And we're going to be at the, uh, uh, the Carmel Farmer's Market on another day and, and so forth. Uh, and they just direct their people to come to the Farmer's Market and, and buy from them. But others sell directly online. Online. Um, so uh, some may have opportunity to sell to a, to a local grocery store or to a restaurant, uh, those kinds of things. The, the general liability for a vendor policy covers them at any kind of organized public event that they want to vend at anywhere in the country. Um, so they could go to farmer's markets, they could go to a festival, they could go to a fair, they could go to a craft show, and the vendor policy that they purchase follows them to any of those events that they vend at and their coverage follows them to those. Uh, so if they're buying an insurance policy to satisfy uh, your requirement as a market, it's not limited to only covering them at your market. It covers them in many other ways. Um, like I said, at any kind of event that they go to, uh, plus if they have uh, uh, product liability issues with the selling to a restaurant or to a store or uh, what they sell online or to their next door neighbor or through a CSA, they have coverage for that. The policy for a vendor does not extend general liability coverage outside of the event venues um, from a general liability standpoint for like slips and falls and that sort of thing. So for example, somebody buys a vendor policy and somebody slips and falls on their residential home driveway or uh, at their farm location, uh, this policy does not extend coverage you know, to full farm liability or, or uh, homeowner's liability. That would, if somebody slips and falls on somebody's driveway, that would need to be covered under their homeowner's policy or their farm policy or, or however they have that structured. But once they leave that and go to an organized public event, their policy just automatically kicks in. Um, and if those, whether the venue requires them to have insurance or not, their policy is there and is in force in case something does happen. Uh, if they require them uh, to have insurance and list that venue as an additional insured, the policy automatically covers that venue as an additional insured. Uh, the, 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 the system that we've set up is kind of slick in that once they buy a policy online, uh, if they're required to list uh, you or another venue as an additional insured, they can add that uh, that no additional cost, uh, and they can do that online through their online account. They just click on Add Additional Insured Certificate Holder. They type in the name and mailing address, click Create Certificate, and it creates the certificate. So they can get a call on a Friday night at midnight that says, hey, we got a spot that opened up tomorrow, but I got to have an insurance certificate listing us as an additional insured. They can pop onto their online account, create it, and, and get that taken care of immediately uh, uh, without having to call an agent. One thing, too, that, that, that you may hear from vendors is if they're getting something outside of a program like this, if they're going to um, uh, a carrier like Erie Insurance or someplace like that, and they, they've got a, a, a commercial general liability policies, uh, policy, a lot of um, insurance companies may charge 30 to $50 for every additional insured that a vendor has to add to a policy. So um, 
uh, it's that's what's nice about having a policy that has an automatic additional insured endorsement on it or blanket additional insured endorsement on it is that they don't get nickel and dime throughout the year. They might pay $400 for a policy that they bought from their local agent and then go to six different events. And by the end of the year, instead of paying $400 for the policy, that policy cost them $600 because they had to, to have all these uh, uh, endorsements for additional insureds that they got charged extra for. So that's one of the advantages to uh, a program like this is they don't get nickel and dime throughout the year. But that's that uh, that's a, a long answer to, a, to, to your question. No, <laughs> actually, I think you covered a couple of the different questions that ha had been asked. Um, so as long as you specifically get your farmer's market policy, any additional insured will there, whatever the number will be covered by that policy. If you're a vendor, any place you vend will be covered by your vendor policy. Correct. Yeah, the, the vendor, the vendor policy will cover the vendor automatically right. at any of the events. Event. They to. And if that event requires them to list that event as an additional insured, uh, they can do so through this program. Anyway, they can right. do so without any additional cost. Okay. So it's a way straight. Okay. So I, hopefully, um, there was one other question about, um, the vendors, if you are insured in Indiana and sell in Indiana, are you also covered if you cross state lines? So I guess this would happen if we're on the borders and like, let's just say up north and you want to vent in a market in Michigan. Correct. Yeah. So the uh, I, I can't speak as to um, what other insurance companies uh, policies would be with regard to that um, were admitted and approved in every state in the country so um, our policy covers them at any organized public event they want to vend at any anywhere in the country whether if they if they're based in indiana and they want to sell and set up at an event in california or in michigan or illinois or ohio or kentucky they're covered Excellent. So here's, um, this is a little bit of an interesting question. And I had this question also. So we have one situation that they have a market, but they're not affiliated with any organization, like no organization or nonprofit, and they haven't, um, they're not a business entity. So they don't have an EIN number. Mm -hmm. um, do they need to be an an official business to be a market to get insurance? Okay, no. Um, and, and we have many markets and vendors that operate as sole proprietors, okay? Um, and uh, so here's, here's, here's what happens and here's, here's the risk to that. Um, so uh, what you would do if you were a market operator and you don't have any kind of uh, LLC or business entity set up, that sort of thing, um, you would buy uh, your insurance policy and you would state a DBA. So it would be the named insured on the policy. You would type in as Bob Smith, DBA, Arlington Farmers Market. Okay. okay. So that names the individual on the policy as a named insured for the market operator, and then list whatever you're, you're calling yourself as the market is also there on that policy. So that, that's, that, that takes care of that. You're, you're, you can buy policies as sole proprietors. That's not a problem. Uh, we get the question where um, it's, it's five of us that are doing it, you know? Um, so in, in, in that particular instance, somebody has to just basically take responsibility and they buy the policy as a sole proprietor. So somebody, you know, is voted to be the president of this particular market. And so that that person buys the insurance policy, they list their personal name and then DBA, which stands for doing business as, uh, and then they would put whatever their fictitious, you know, market name is that that isn't actually, you know, a registered business. 
the risk that you take with that, whether you're a market operator buying as a sole proprietor or a vendor operating as a sole proprietor, is that if the insurance limit is breached and uh, we haven't had that happen yet, knock on wood, um, but if the insurance limit is breached and say your market is, uh, there's a death that occurs uh, at your market and it's in uh, a sympathetic jury awards a $1.5 million judgment. Your insurance, if you have a million dollar per occurrence limit, your insurance policy is going to pay the million dollar limit, uh, but yet there's $500,000 left over. Well, as a sole proprietor, uh, they're going to uh, come after you personally for anything above what the insurance uh, didn't didn't cover. So they could come after your house. They could come after your wages for the rest of your life, you know, that sort of thing. So that's the risk you take in operating as a sole proprietorship. Like I say, we haven't had uh, uh, insurance policy limit breached yet. Um, it has happened. It hasn't happened to us. Um, there was a market in California that had a car drive in and uh, there were uh, into the market and there were multiple fatalities, um, ultimately ended up with $20 million um, in insurance uh, or, or $20 million in, in judgments uh, that were paid out because of that incident. Um, but that's, uh, that's I, I don't want to scare you into you know, worst case scenarios, um, but you just need to be aware of what the risk is if you're operating as a sole proprietorship. Uh, if you set up an LLC um, and the, the policy is purchased under the, uh, under the LLC, that uh, LLC is limited liability corporation. The reason that it's limited liability is it limits that liability to the assets that are owned by the LLC. Um, and so if that insurance limit is breached, they can't come after you personally for uh, anything over and above what the insurance limit is. They can only go after what is, is owned by the, by the LLC. I'm not an attorney or an accountant. I'm not providing legal advice. Uh, uh, I have to make that disclaimer. <laughs> so uh, if, you're, if you're concerned about uh, setting those kinds of things up, you wanna talk to your CPA and attorney about, about getting uh, an LLC established if, if that's a concern that you have. Um, always recommend that first all proprietors uh, that they pay the extra 25 bucks and get the $2 million uh, limit instead of the $1 million limit. Uh, just that gives you that extra, extra level of protection there, just in case you have a, a worst case type scenario. You don't buy insurance for the $500 claim, you buy insurance for the, for the $2 million claim. Um, uh, in the event that something catastrophic does, does happen to happen. So, um, oh, one other thing that it, it may be on the question list, it may not be on the question list, uh, but I want to address it because it is fairly common question that comes up. Uh, and I know I'm running short on time here, um, but I get asked all the time, is, is there a policy that a market can buy that just blanket covers all of the vendors and the market pays one fee and it just covers everybody that's there? Uh, uh, and we haven't been able to find a legitimate insurance company that's willing to do that because they're basically handing over the underwriting pen to the market manager and saying, anybody that you accept into your market to be a vendor, regardless of their past claims history, regardless of what it is that you're, that they're selling, um, uh, the, the, that we're going to insure them. They don't want to give up that kind of control and the ability to say no and actually look at a risk and see whether or not they want to insure it. So uh, haven't found any place out there that's, that's willing to do just kind of a blanket cover across the board. Uh, the market manager might think that somebody manufacturing and selling baby, baby food, organic baby food is the best thing in the whole wide world, but uh, the insurance company uh, uh, may feel that selling baby food is actually prohibited in their um, uh, underwriting guidelines and they don't want to cover that. So they don't want to accidentally be covering things that they, that they aren't allowed to cover. So 
Anyway, um, all right, go ahead. Uh, uh, other I questions? I do have on... two questions, but one dovetails with what we were just talking about. So um, if you are a nonprofit or an organization sponsoring a market, do you, should you buy specifically farmer's market insurance for your market program? You already have insurance as a functioning organization. Sure. So you want to check with your um, with your insurance uh, folks that are insuring you already um, and make sure that that would be an insured activity. Um, uh, uh, and so you want to make sure that that's that that's OK. I, I've had instances where municipalities have have said, oh, well, we've got an insurance policy. We don't need one for the insurance uh, or for the farmer's market because we um, uh, have insurance and uh, for for the municipality and then come to find out that the insurance company uh, had that in small print that those kinds of activities were excluded. Not so covered. Right. so you, you just want to make sure that 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 you are covered. Um, uh, I would say if you have a nonprofit organization like that, that you'd, you'd want to get a, um, a certificate of insurance from your insurance company um, that would state um, uh, uh, your, your entity name and then have them add uh, to it DBA and then the name of the farmer's market that you're going to be um, operating under that um, so that you have a certificate of insurance where that DBA or that farmer's market is specifically named as an insured. Okay, sounds good. There was a question about weather, um, like anything that happens because of weather, is that automatically covered in your policies? Yeah, so um, it's not a it's not a cancellation um, type policy to where if you have to close down the market because of weather that you get reimbursed for the fact that you had to close. If that's the question, the answer is no. Um, if it's a situation to where uh, a, a wind comes through and and picks up vendors' tents and they they blow across and they injure people and damage property, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Yes, weather is covered under that. Okay, thank you. There was oh, oh, a and, and, and just real quick, liability is liability. It doesn't cover property or replacement of property that you own. So if you have a canopy and it rips up and blows away and damages somebody's car, uh, it will pay to, re to repair that person's car that was, was damaged. It will not pay to replace your tent. It's just liability only. Okay. There was a question that had to do with Amish vendors. Mm -hmm. They provide a certificate different than the Accord 25. Is there any reason for concern? This is a this is an exception that we do accept um, uh, that the Amish community uh, provides a, uh, a a statement uh, contractually in writing that states that the Amish community um, is is self insuring that that they will pay for for any. Uh, cost of defense or risks that the that the market or that vendor would incur, um, we do we do accept that as as legitimate insurance for the Amish. Perfect. Well, I, we are a little bit after eleven, and we have our next session coming up. So I thank you, Larry. It's been an outstanding presentation. Thank you for everyone who's participated, and um, there's. I will download the chat and I'll make that available and we are recording the web, the presentation and that will also be made available. So thank you all. If you have any questions, give me a holler. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day and uh, uh, stay safe and well. Thank you, Larry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.